Hi, welcome back. To this, my third data update for 2024. In my last update, I looked at what equities did in 2023 and mapped out the fact that equities recovered in 2023, the bounce back here, partly driven by the fact that expectations were low, but that return was uneven. A few companies and a few sectors did well, but a lot of sectors basically did nothing in 2023. In this session, I'd like to look at interest rates, both from a government perspective and corporate markets, to see what 2023 delivered on interest rates and look to see whether there are some links in what equities and bonds did in the year. I'm going to argue that what we saw, especially with the interest rate market in 2023, should make us question two widely used rules of thumb or at least delusions that we've carried in markets. The first is that the Fed somehow sets interest rates. It can raise and lower them at will. And the other is that a downward sloping yield curve is almost a surefire predictor of a recession. So let's get started by looking at government rates and in particular US Treasuries. In this graph, I've looked at the, you know, the US Treasuries across maturities, three month, two year, 10 year and third year, between 2022 and 2023. And what a difference the two years make. In 2022, rates soared across the board, short term and long term. In fact, long term rates soared so much that it was the worst bond market year in history in terms of returns. 2023 was a much quieter year. It's true t bill rates continued to rise over the course of the year by about a percent. But the two-year rate actually decreased, the 10-year rate stayed even, and the 30-year rate basically also stayed even. It rose about 0.06% very different year. Interest rates clearly, for the most part, especially at the long end of the spectrum, did nothing. Now that might surprise you, because the story you've been listening to for much of the last year is about how the Fed has been raising rates. So you're saying the Fed has been raising rates, how come the 10-year, the 2-year and the 30-year rates did not go up? To get a sense of what the Fed did during 2022 and 2023, I looked at the Fed funds rate, which is, after all, the only interest rate the Fed controls. It's the overnight borrowing rate that banks use. None of us ever borrowed the Fed funds rate. And it's true. 2022 and 2023 bought lots of action. In 2022 alone, the Fed raised the Fed funds rate seven times, from close to 0% to end the year at 4.5%. In 2023, it continued to raise rates four more times, and 0.25% increases or 25 basis point increases that got us from 4.5 to 5.5%. You think there, that explains interest rates going up in 2022, but does it? To take a closer look at the link between what the Fed did and what the US Treasury markets did with demand and supply set rates, here's what I did. I went back and looked at every Fed action in 2022 and 2023, the seven increases in 2022 and the four increases in 2023. So if you take the very first increase in 2022, March 17, the Fed raised the Fed funds rate, and this is the upper end of the rate from 0.25% to 0.5%. But note that they did it after the T-bill rate went from 0.08 to 0.40%. In other words, the T-bill rate went up first, the Fed increased rates. And in fact, if you look across 2022, that's exactly the pattern you see. T-bill rates rise, the Fed raises rates. T-bill rates rise again, the Fed raises rates. Now, I, it might be my biased perspective, but if you're looking for leaders and followers here, it looks like the market is leading and the Fed is following. In 2023, the Fed continued to increase rates. T-bill rates continued to drift up, perhaps ahead of the Fed moving. But T-bond rates basically lost their connection to the Fed. As we noted, the Fed, the T-bond rate over the course of the year did nothing in spite of, T, of the Fed raising Fed funds rates four times. Now you might say, what's going on? Why aren't Treasury rates responding to the Fed? Well, I think to understand that, you've got to go back to basics. You've got to think about what it is that drives long-term interest rates. And it's not the Fed. If you don't, I don't know whether you remember the Fisher equation from Econ 101. The Fisher equation basically breaks down a nominal interest rate into a, an expected inflation component and a real interest rate component. I'm going to make two assumptions to build up to my version of what T-bond rates should be. First, I'm going to assume that in the long term, real interest rates and real growth rates have to converge. It's a steady state requirement. 
Second, I'm going to look at the actual inflation rates and real GDP growth rates each year. And I'm going to construct a very simplistic measure, what I'm going to call an intrinsic T-bond rate. I take the inflation rate, let's say it's 3%, let's say real growth is 2%, 3 plus 2 is 5. That becomes my intrinsic risk-free rate for the year. And I've graphed it up from 1954 all the way to 2023. I know it's simplistic. I know, I know I'm making strong assumptions, but look at how well it explains the ebbs and flows in the T-bond rate over time. The T-bond rate is the black line. It explains why T-bond rates exploded in the 1970s. It's because inflation shot up. It explains why interest rates were low for the last decade. I know the conventional wisdom is the Fed kept them there, but did it? During the last decade, inflation was low, real growth was low, low plus low was low. The biggest reason for low rates was low inflation and low real growth. Now, I'm, I'm realistic. I understand the Fed at the margin can affect rates, and it might have kept rates a little lower than the intrinsic rate, and I think it did. But to argue that the Fed somehow has the power to keep rates low and the fundamentals push in the other direction is missing the point. You think what happened in the last couple of years? When inflation came back. Inflation came back. It doesn't matter what the Fed thinks. Rates are going to rise. In fact, the question is, why didn't rates rise more? It looks like the market is building in a higher expected inflation, but not 7 or 8%, but closer to 3%. Now, along the way, there was another another conventionally used rule that came under assault. When you, when you graph out rates across different maturities, you get a yield curve. And it's true, historically, the slope of the yield curve has provided information about what the economy is doing. In stro when, the, when the economy is stronger, and this I'm talking about U.S. data, it's usually the, the yield curve is upward sloping. The more upward sloping the yield curve, the stronger economic growth has been. And as the yield curves become flat to downward sloping, economic growth has dropped off. That's been true for a century here. But during the last couple of decades, we've created this new rule where if you have an inverted yield curve, it guarantees that you're going to go into recession. And in 2022 and 2023, we saw the noisiness of that prediction. Now again, I think inverted yield curves are a signal of a, of a slowing economy, but they're a noisy signal. What does that mean? Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. If you look at every measure of the yield curve in 2022 and 23, and I'm using three year, the first, the green line, is the difference between the 10 year rate and the two year rate. It turned negative on July 3rd of 2022. I looked at the 10 year minus the three month table rate. It turned negative on October 25th of 2022. And I looked at the two-year minus the three-month rate, and that turned negative in dis on December 31st of 2022. We spent an entire year in 2023 with the yield curve being downward sloping. We kept you know, expecting a recession, but none arrived. Now, don't get me wrong. It's entirely possible that a recession might arrive in 2024 or 2025. Recessions arrive when they do. But what good is a signal when it takes you two and a half years for that signal to deliver the outcome? that you, it told you would get. So on both the Fed controlling rates and the negative sloping yield curve, I think 2023 was a reminder that you, you, you've got to be careful about the conclusions you jumped to. Now let's talk a little bit about government bond rates and other currencies. The US Treasury, of course, is a US dollar government bond rate. And if you assume there's no default risk in the US Treasury, it becomes the US dollar risk rate rate. In this table, I've looked at U.S. Uh, local currency government bond rates in about 40 different currencies. What do these currencies share in common? They all are currencies where the government has issued 10-year bonds denominating the local currency. Lots of governments don't, but these governments do. And I've looked at the 10-year bond rate in the local currency in the end of 2021, end of 2022, end of 2023. And the change in 2022 and 2023. Remember that U.S. Treasuries rose strongly in 2022 before kind of leveling off and even falling for the, for the longer maturities in 2023. You see that same phenomenon play out in other government bond rates. A strong rise in 2022, a leveling off in 2023. Now, of course, there are a lot of analysts who use these government bond rates as risk-free rates when they work with these currencies in valuation or analysis. And I always had pause in doing that because 
Now, that assumes implicitly that governments don't default in local currency bonds. Why? They can print more and pay off the debt, right? But here's an empirical fact. In the last 50 years, half of all sovereign defaults have been local currency defaults. Governments often choose to default in the local currency because they'd rather default than debase their currency. What that effectively means is these government bond rates have a default risk component that you need to clean up for to get to a risk-free rate. So again, I adopt a very simplistic way of cleaning up a default risk. I take the sovereign rating for a country. Remember, there are two sovereign ratings, a foreign currency rating and a local currency rating for every country. I take the local currency rating. If it's AAA, I take the government bond rate as my risk free rate. Australia, Germany, Scandinavian countries, and the US at least for the moment. If you're not AAA, I estimate the default spread based on your sovereign rating. And I have a lookup table. You tell me your sovereign rating. So your, your rating is BA2 and the default spread is 2.5%. I net that default spread out of the government bond rate to get to a risk free rate. So the red portions, the default spreads netted, netted out. And the blue that you're left with is the risk free rate in different currencies. Mickey has said a couple of things about this graph that are obvious, but might as well emphasize them. The first is, there are still two currencies with negative risk free rates. One is the Japanese yen, a long-standing member of the lower negative interest rate club. Low growth, deflation. The other is a surprise, the Vietnamese dong. Now this might partly reflect the fact that the Vietnamese government bond rate might not actually be a traded rate. There's not much liquidity in the bond, but if it is, then the Vietnamese dong risk free rate is negative. But there are risk free rates which are as high as 10, 11 percent, risk free rates as low as 1 or 2 percent. It raises the question, why do risk free rates vary across currencies? The answer, and you might disagree with me, is it's surprisingly simple. It's differences in expected inflation. High inflation currencies have high risk free rates, low inflation currencies have low risk free rates, and deflationary currencies can have negative risk free rates. Now, of course, that's why currencies don't matter in valuation. If you pick a low inflation currency to value a company, you get a low discount rate. You project growth in the cash flows, you have to build in a low inflation rate. You switch to a high inflation currency, you have a high discount rate and a much higher growth rate. Which brings me to the final part of what I want to talk about, which is the rate at which companies can borrow money. Now, if you have a risk-free rate, companies obviously cannot borrow at that risk-free rate because they have default risk, even the largest and safest companies. They can't print money to pay off their debt. So when you lend to a company or buy its bonds, you have to build in a spread to cover that credit to default risk. It's a default spread. The more risk you see in a company, the larger that spread will become. So when you assess the cost of debt for a company, the question you're asking is, what is the default spread? Now, a large subset of companies have bond ratings, where ratings agencies assess their default risk from AAA all the way down to D. Now, you might or might not trust ratings agencies, but it's convenient to have a measure of default risk that somebody else has put the time in. One of the advantages of ratings is because you've traded bonds with ratings, you can estimate what the default spread markets are demanding on each ratings class are. And I've estimated that default spread in 2022 and 2023 in this graph. And this is a story here again. In 2022, default spreads rose across ratings classes and more so for the lowest rated companies. In 2023, you saw a great deal of that increase in 2022 go away. In fact, for the higher rated bonds, almost all of the surge you saw in default spreads has gone away. The triple C and lowest is still, even though the, rate, the default spreads come down, it's still higher than it was at the start of 2022. Now, if you're wondering what's going on here, remember that the default spread is the price of risk in the bond market. The price of risk reflects fears in the market, and as fears ebb and flow, you're going to see default spreads reflect that. Now, you might remember when I did my last session on equities, I talked about the equity risk premiums being the price of risk in the equity market. And if you remember, the equity risk premium rose strongly in 2022. People were afraid and dropped back again in 2023 you see that same phenomenon play out with default spreads. And it's not just 2022 and 2023. In the next graph, I actually have the equity risk premium, the red line, and the default spread graphed out from 1960 through 2023. For the most part, the two move together. 
Why should that surprise you? When people are afraid in equity markets, they're usually afraid in bond markets. It's because some macro force that's driving fear in both markets. But there have been a couple of periods where the two have disconnected. The first in the late 90s, where equity risk premiums drifted down to hit almost 2%, while default spread stayed high. There's, of course, the dot-com boom, and the dot-com bust corrected for that. Then in the early part of the century, default spreads plummeted. In the post-9-11, Alan Greenspan put bond markets sort of flush with cash, but equity risk premiums stayed high. And that, of course, was a precursor to the 2008 correction. What I'm saying is when these two markets disconnect, it's usually a signal that there's a correction ahead. So at the start of 2024, what do things look like? Well, with the equity risk premium of 4.6% and default spreads of about 1.6%, 1.7%, we're well within the normal range. Doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. But there's nothing in the difference there that would lead me to worry the way I would have in 2008 or in 2000. So here's the bottom line. The bond market in many ways mirrored the equity markets. It, you know, it, a bad 2022, a comeback in 2023. No. But even after everything has been said and done, even after that comeback, interest rates now for companies are far higher than they were before inflation came into the game. That is a reality that we'll talk about when we look at the debt that companies have and whether they have too much debt. But the question is, what will interest rates do in 2024? I don't know, but here's what I do know. All this happy talk of the Fed cutting rates is completely irrelevant to what interest rates will do in 2024. In fact, let's assume the Fed does cut rates over the course of this year. Interest rates will will map out their own path and they will be driven by what happens to inflation. If the good news on inflation we saw in 2023 continues into 2024, inflation continues on a downward path, interest rates will continue to decline, no matter what the Fed does. Conversely, if interest rates level off or go up, then interest rates, I'm sorry, inflation levels or levels off or goes up, interest rates will rise, no matter what the Fed does. Inflation continues to be the driver of interest rates, as it always has. I hope you found the session useful and I thank you very much for listening.